Now, naming, naming. The next chapter, we focused heavily on naming. Names come are how we're going to describe just about any, any type of uh, compound. So, but the first thing we had to do is recognize what type of compound we're dealing with. Recognize what type of compound we're dealing with so we can help break down the simplicity in the name. We can first, I would typically break it down into whether it's ionic or covalent compound. Ionic was a metal plus a non-metal. Covalent was a non-metal plus a non-metal. As we learn now, the covalent bonds are the sharing of electrons. The ionic bonds were the fully charged things where we one atom has given up its electrons to become a positive cation and one atom was what has accepted those electrons to become a negative anion. From there, we could break it down into various different classes. Now, this one kind of fits somewhere between ionic and covalent in that when we have hydrogen plus a non-metal, we typically have an acid. But the ionic we could break down into transition metal plus a non-metal versus group one, two, or three, and a non-metal. Zinc and so on. And with the non-metals, we could really break it down into essentially, this is usually binary. When we had the cation and the anions, when we had the cation and anion with the, the ionic, the cation just is the name. Straight up, the cation is just the name of the element. We didn't have to worry about that. The anion would get the IDE ending. And depending on what the name is, depended on how much we cut off, like sulfur becomes sulfide. Nitrogen becomes nitride. Oxygen becomes oxide. Fluor fluorine becomes fluoride. So it, there was some method to the madness, but it wasn't pretty straightforward. Now we combined them together, combined to make neutral. Make neutral. So if I used, say, Na plus and O2 minus, so Na plus sodium oxide, we're going to have to put two sodiums with one oxygen. But this one would just still be sodium oxide. Remember, we have to use the periodic table as a guide to predicting the charges. Typically, when we're the basic names, we group seven metals, uh, non-metals were minus one, group six were minus two, group five minus three, group four minus four, and so on. Uh, and Group one metals were plus one, group two metals were plus two, group three metals were plus three. Zinc was two plus and silver was plus one. So if I mix together, say, silver and bromine, I would have silver bromide. Now, when it was a transition metal, because transition metals have more than one oxidation state. We had to physically state the charge. 
physically state the charge. So it wasn't so straightforward. So the transition metal, let's see, name plus charge as a Roman numeral. So if I use, for example, copper plus and, let's see, NO3 minus, just using nitrate. We have a weird compound here. This would be copper one nitrate with a formula of CuNO3. If I had the tin four plus and O2 minus, would have to call that tin four oxide with SnO2. In these cases, you would have to utilize the charge of the uh, anion to try to figure out what the charge of the cation must be. If I was giving a structure and asked to give it a name or name asked to give it a structure. There was certain common oxy anions we were expected to know. Quick reiteration, OH minus was hydroxide. CN minus was cyanide. Uh, cyanide. C2H3O2, one minus is acetate. And then we had our oxy, well, those are polyatomics. The oxy anions we typically saw were nitrate, carbonate, sulfate, uh, phosphate, and our perchlorate and chlorate. There were a lot more than just these, but these were the ones we saw with some degree of regularity. Everything else was not that common. Those guys had special names that designated the oxygen count that if we have two different options, the eight went to the more oxygens and the eight went to the less oxygens. So like nitrate versus nitrite. Phosphate versus phosphite. Though phosphite isn't really, isn't really stable, at least not there. Sulfate, a sulfite. So, sorry, that went off the screen. But these guys had a set charge that it helps to memorize. So when we say, I put sodium, if I had sodium, uh, sulfite, I can go, well, sodium is Na plus, sulfite is SO3, two minus, so a structure would be Na2SO3, because I know this is two minus and I need two plus to cancel it out. Now, when we had our acids, when we had our acids, we could break those acids down into two groups. If it was an acid and an anion, acid and an anion like HCl, HBr, HF, HI, and maybe H2S, we had hydro and the we, our base anion chlor, and then we put. IC acid instead of ID. 
hydrochloric acid, this guy hydrobromic acid, hydrofluoric acid, hydroiodic acid, that'd be hydrosulfuric acid. So we change the, we add a hydro, have our base name and have ICE acid. But when we did it with these oxyanions, it, it just, the AT, when we did it with oxyanions like acetic acid, HC2H3O2 or HNO3, the eight went to ic acid. So this is instead of acetate, acetic acid. Nitrate becomes nitric acid. And the and the NO2, the, the us, the it goes to us. Like HNO2, instead of being nitric, it becomes nitrous acid. H2SO3 becomes sulfurous acid instead of sulfuric. Us. So, changed how we how we changed the name phosphoric acid and phosphorus acid changes the name slightly. Now, the last one, the main type with our two nonmetals, our covalent, we broke it down into two things. Covalent. The first element, element, acts as cation, as cation. The second as the anion. So that means the first one will just get the name, the second one would get a IDE ending. Second one would get an IDE ending. But because these were both nonmetals, we couldn't easily predict their charges. There wasn't an easy way to predict the charges. So instead of doing the transition metal thing where we call it a Roman numeral, we're going to actually give it a prefix for the number or number. The first element, element, we will assume one unless otherwise. Unless otherwise. So we will not name the first element unless it is not one. The second one will always get an ending. So if I say NO2, I would just call this nitrogen, and then I go to oxygen, so di oxide. But if it's N2O, we would call that di nitrogen monoxide. Mono meaning one, dinitrogen monoxide. So depend, the first guy is assumed one unless it's not true. Our base names were mono for one, di, and then it gets easy, tri, let's see. Or, I'm not sure we really have four, but I'm, four slips my mind right now. But five is pent, six is hex, and then hept, and then oct. We typically didn't see more than pent, oct, non, and Deca. Is it 
you I don't know it'll come back to me later but so the idea here is that we could name these guys whatever we needed to based on that so if like so3 if I said so3 2 minus that's sulfite but so3 neutral is sulfur trioxide oxide so we have to look the charge or lack thereof tells us whether we're dealing with a covalent molecule or an ionic molecule so no2 nitrogen dioxide no2 one minus would be nitrite you can look at those no tetra tetra thank you Okay, so four is tetra. So, now, now, with that in mind, we can do anything you want. And with that in mind, I'll use that. N204 would be dinitrogen tetroxide. Oxide. So that's way... If we, if we have a charge, we treat it as ionic. If it's no charge, we're going to treat it as covalent. That's the basics of telling the difference. Because oftentimes, I know I, in the past, have tried to trick students. They get so used to memorizing nitrate, nitrite. And then when they see NO2 or NO3, they're going to go, oh, that's nitrate, and not think Where's the cation? Where's the charge? It's not there, so it is clearly, it's gonna be a covalent type structure. Now, there's also a way of naming organic compounds, but we did not cover it this semester, so we're not gonna worry about this. That'll be something you'll experience if and when you get to organic chemistry.